I'm Fran Jenkins, and I'm here to have a conversation today with Dr. Priyan Armagan, who has been a physician here in Port McNeil for quite a number of years. Thank you for inviting us into your home to have this conversation. So how long have you been up here? Well, you're welcome. And 15 years in Port McNeil now. It's not often that we have physicians that stay that long. So you've decided to make Port McNeil home. Indeed, yeah. Mo having moved from South Africa originally uh, via the UK, Port McNeil is my home, true North Islander. The Port McNeil Medical Clinic has been serving people here for longer than, than you were around. Um, at, but that clinic was owned not by one physician or, or currently is not owned by one physician. It's owned by a medical collaborative. So it's not one person making decisions, it's That's right. the team. That's right. And it's a private practice. It is. At this point, although the building was owned by uh, two physicians. Yes. I think it's important to separate the, the real estate or the building being owned. At one stage it was owned by one or a group of physicians, but that's purely the, the building and the real estate. The practice itself has always been, a, in a sense, a collaborative practice. The decisions are made as associates within the practice. And so there's no one person owning a practice. Okay. And, and I love the idea of the collaborative because um, you just have more success when mm. everybody's on the same page. And I want to clarify at this point that as a private practice, you did not receive government funding. Correct. So uh, over the years, uh, for, during the time that uh, I was working out of that building, uh, as well as even before me, there was no government funding. It's purely private practices. It's ultimately through the ministry. You bill for services that you provide. And there was no um, health authority or, or provincial funding as there have been in other practices in the region. So I know in education, the government funds the public schools in the province, mm -hmm. but they also fund, to a lesser degree, the private schools, which are also getting funding from tuition. Tax dollars support the Port Hardy Clinic, supported the Alert Bay Clinic, the Santula, Port Alice, all of these clinics were receiving government money for their operations. And the Port McNeil Medical Collaborative was not. Correct. You know, the, uh, uh, many of those clinics receive um, the administrative pieces the, and, and therefore the overhead pieces around how those clinics are run. It makes a big difference for doctors to focus on, on clinical care rather than have to worry about staffing resources and managing you know, other costs of the clinic. So it has been a, a reasonably good model. It has helped recruitment retention of physicians. Port McNeil has been left to, uh, to continue by themselves in, in this private practice environment because we were doing well. We, we continued to do well for many, many years. In fact, over 10 years ago, we, we embraced this integrated team approach. Um, Island, we had encouraged Island Health to partner with us. They did to a, to a small extent, uh, but it wasn't really funding, per se, as, as other clinics in the region. So when we talked earlier, you kind of, uh, you used the phrase that the clinic was the orphan child. I thought that's kind of really appropriate. So at some point then, the collaborative asked, at the time it was VHA, I imagine, um, that the medical clinic in Port McNeil should, reserve, should receive some financial support from them. And what was their response to that? You know, through, through successes in Port Hardy and because we were aware that other clinics in the region were, were funded, were, were helped significantly financially and support-wise, uh, the, the recruitment changed in Port Hardy. There was a greater appetite, there was more success. Port Hardy was in the exact same situation we were. The demographic and the patient population was different, but the same situation in terms of recruiting people, retaining people, physicians, and other healthcare professionals. By changing the model, we, were, we, we realized that it was, a, it was a better successful recruitment strategy and certainly a retention strategy. The region is a beautiful place to live and work, but, uh, but you know, it comes down to, to where people choose to work. It's they want things that are, that are easier for them to do. We'd, we'd asked at least five years ago and, and continued to ask um, 
that that wasn't quite heard at, at that time. Um, we were we were left to continue with with the model that we we've been accustomed to over years. So their response was basically, "It's working. Why should we step in?" Yes, and, and interestingly, you know, the, the responsibility, I think, for provision of health care is given to the health authorities in the province by the province, by the ministry. And, and in a way, we were doing their job really well, and therefore it wasn't broken and they didn't need to fix it. Even though we said the writing's on the wall, this is becoming unsustainable, you know, we want to be more successful at recruiting and retaining people, um, but we were doing a good job of it until you know there was dwindling physician numbers and well there we are yeah and then came COVID, and that kind of really shook things up just because of the sheer volume of uh, medical issues involved around that but then around march 2020 uh something happened that kind of really shook you up and that you were witness to remarks that you felt were attacks on your character and your integrity. And how did that make you feel and, and what actions did you take at that point? You know, it was, it was a very difficult time, uh, apart from COVID, which, which rocked everybody. And, and as I, there was a big ask from the, from the health system in its broadest sense and politically for everybody. But personally, there were, there were, there were things that were happened that there, there were a culmination of events around that time um, that centered around um, my ethnicity, my background, um, and, and largely because I was advocating for people to create this equality. Uh, there, were, there were attacks on my integrity, essentially, uh, and for the work I've done, which was very damaging to me partly because of where I've come from in terms of my South African background. Um, I reported that to, to senior executives within Island Health. They, um, they, they said they were going to do an inquiry. I've yet to hear back from the, from the results of that inquiry. As, as part of being a thorn and, and because I reported this to this day, I was viewed as a troublemaker. And their intent became to, to limit my practice in Port McNeil. Um, because because of how whatever they perceived was 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 real for them, there was no there was no objectivity or data, but mostly there was inference around things. It was more convenient for me not to be here, rather than them having to do a formal dive into what and why the problem is, and it left me with a place of turmoil and 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 upset for for quite a long time. And for me, that was a sense of injustice. There was a narrative created that, that I'm the person as to why Port McNeil wasn't working rather than the brokenness and the lack of response from the health authority. Um, and, and in a way, I, I, I feel sad about having bought that response and narrative from them in the sense that um, we've allowed to continue. We've pushed for a new model. I th we've, we finally got there. Even when we were pushing for a new model, I said, the new model is only as good as how well it's administered. And again, the data, the objectivity around how well it's efficiently run. We asked for a slightly different thing to what Port Hardy was going. In fact, better in the sense of, uh, of an APP type environment. And that means a different way in which how the doctors are remunerated because that tends to be a bit of a rub in the region as well. Uh, they haven't quite got to that stage yet, but by and large, there was a there was a there was an intent to to limit my practice in Port McNeil and to silence me from 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 saying the things that I needed to say. Um, but more importantly, there was an expectation that I abandon patients in Port McNeil. Um, a lot of people have come up to me and said, you know, what, what's going on? We don't understand. And, and there was a lot of lack of messaging on, on the health authority part and a lack of disclosure, which I cannot apologize on their behalf. But it, 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 was, I, I was, it was very morally conflicting for me to not say anything, to not do anything. And, and here we are again. So from Island Health's perspective, you were rocking their boat yep. on two sides. One, because you were asking for financial support, yep. and also because of the actions uh, um, that you were expecting them to take based on the remarks that you'd heard. So you were, according to them, just being difficult. 
yes, I something think, that you they needed to manage. And that's exactly how it all translated. I've, I've been a thorn advocating for patients and, and providers in the region, but this other piece about their lack of response and, and not actioning things, which I believe largely is a lack of a tool set amongst their senior executive to deal with things like this, Unfortunately, these people also have the ear of the board, of the Island Health Board, and the board make decisions on things which they are not fully informed on, and, and, and the machine carries on. We, we all just live and, and make do and coexist despite all of that, and I think there's an injustice there. So you are trying to advocate for your patients and the people of the district and for yourself. Indeed. Which everyone should be entitled to do. Yep. So then Viha, or now Island Health at this point, decides that they're going to have a, open up a whole new clinic that will be publicly funded rather than support the one that currently existed. That never made sense to me. <laughs> yes, it never made Why? sense. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, it, I think it never made sense to a lot of people. We had hoped for a transition of that clinic to morph into services that were established between, so how to access things. Well, this is not a new problem. Like I said, 10 years ago, we'd, we'd en enveloped the idea of, of integrated care. We'd, we'd, we'd gone around and like said, this is how we should do care, and this, this team-based idea of care. And we'd grow, we, we'd had already ironed out a lot of the bugs. The process was good in terms of how people access different aspects of care. Um, the, it, would make, it would make the most sense to transition that into something that was better supported, which was what we were really asking. Somehow, maybe that was misunderstood. Maybe they had their own intention anyway, which it appears they may have. And, and it fragmented what was established. It fragmented the work that myself and other doctors before me have done to embrace this concept of team-based care, integrated care, primary care network, if you like. Uh, but mostly, it, it, it basically broke down what we had. It just didn't make a lot of sense for anybody and still doesn't. And, and I think, too, the, the, um, the specifics of our geographical region complicate things because it's not just a Port McNeil clinic. True. You know, people from Sointula, Alert Bay, WAS, even though they have their own clinics, often come here. So, and, and physicians from here do clinics there. So it, it's kind of more of a widespread thing rather than, than a clinic focused uh, service provision. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's been, you know, the outreach communities, including Port Hardy, Port Alice, people access care here. Now, it's not to say some people from here access care elsewhere, because mm -hmm. it's really the patient prerogative, patient right to access care where they feel most comfortable. And, and, and you're right, that it's not just for Port McNeil. There's many other remote communities. We can look in, on Rivers Inlet on the mainland actually access care through us. Kinkham Inlet uh, used to do until not until recently. And like you say, the interdependency between Port Alert Bay, because for people to get off that island, so in Tula to get off that island, mm -hmm. people as far down as was access care with us primarily. So you're right, it's not just a Port McNeil problem, but it's this, it's this hub of, of uh, care provision. So when VHA decided to open their clinic, or Island Health at this point, they did not want you to be a part of it. Mostly because I was vocal, because I was a thorn, because I've asked them to look into something that they were uncomfortable or lack a tool set to, to, to look into. And the short answer is yes, they gave me a six month transition period from the time that they bought the clinic from. I was the last man standing of the last physician group, so I, the building had defaulted to me. I, I, so they bought the building off me, uh, but I, I was not. Um, uh, a welcome into the new clinic. They gave me a six month transition period by which I should vacate the building. You mentioned primary care network. Can you tell me a little bit about what that means and, and how it kind of fits with sure. Port McNeil? It's, uh, you know, it, it, this is a concept that's evolved over time. We, when we were at medical school and, and when we were earlier on in this, in this concept, it was the patient-centeredness concept, where, where, where the patient is at the center of all the care wrapped around them. They talk, over the years, this has morphed into many different things, team-based care, integrated care, and it's landed at this primary care network where, where maybe under one roof or within one uh, locality that different services can wrap around the 
patient um, and hence the primary care network, whether that's sort of emergency services sometime, whether that's primary care services, and there are facilities and buildings where this has been happening. And it's a, it's a way of wrapping around full service care around a patient. So primary care network has, uh, has, has, is, an, is the current initiative. This, this is the same concept of patient centeredness that has is, that is morphed into, into where we are now. Uh, it's a provincial guide uh, at the moment. Uh, a lot of the South Island places, Victoria, uh, further up island, have, have tried to get into this model. It would be fair to say that um, Island Health has been primarily involved in, in hospital care, in, in, in facility care. Primary health care, the physicians who've been providing care in private clinics over the years are the most uh, familiar uh, with, with this kind of care. Um, Island Health is yet to get there in terms of how to embrace the primary health care network. There's, there's, there's some successes, but mostly not yet in, in some of the South Island practices. Port McNeil has already had this for over 10 years. Do you think that, that it's kind of been a good fit for us because we are smaller? Being smaller and having a private clinic, the nimbleness of being able to, to make change, effect change, and maintain that sustainability has been to our benefit over those, over those years. As a small town and as a private clinic, those are two big advantages of us to, to be able to do that. And, and this was established, this was, this was fine-tuned over the years, like I said, by me and doctors before me, mm -hmm. over at least the last 10 years. So in 2021, As a patient, I was confused. The medical clinic was open, and then it was closed. And then it was open again. And I know I'm not the only one that was confused. And I'm kind of like, what is going on? But all of that was because of Island Health flip-flopping about you being able to, to continue your practice. Yes, and so that they, their initial stance was, you know, we can, we can tolerate you only as much as we get new doctors, but when new doctors come, we, we want you out of our new clinic. We will give you the six month transition period and we'll help support you, which they have. Uh, I, I hope they will continue to honor that six month period that ends in December. So the, the initial tune was, was that, then the tune about a month ago changed to, well, you know, we, we haven't really been having any new doctors yet, but could you, would you be able to or willing to stay for a little bit longer? And, and I said yes. So we were in discussions around about a month ago for me to join the, the new clinic and to transition new doctors, to transition patient care to, to the new doctors um, and ultimately fix this whole record transfer business and that kind of stuff. Um, within the last week, I was notified that they've changed their mind yet again and mostly stemming from me further advocating for transparency and fairness in how the clinic was administered, what contracts were, were in place. They would not, could not disclose that. Uh, it's, it, you know, this, this is sort of the theme with, with uh, organizations and certainly Island Health. Um, and therefore, I was no longer a fit for the new clinic. They severed all ties and said, but you're welcome to open a new clinic. You, uh, there's no barriers for you to open a new clinic, private clinic. Um, good luck. See you later. And this was a week ago when I'd, a month ago I was informed that, you know, we were going to be part of the new clinic. We'd put a lot of things in place for me to transition into the new clinic. Um, many patients, staff, et cetera, who were, were aware of, some of them were aware of what was happening. They were, they were quite happy about that. And as was I, I, I had, you know, the people said, weren't you going to stop and retire anyway? That retirement narrative was, was born out of Island Health intention to basically push me out of the clinic in Port McNeil and limit my practice in Port McNeil. This, yes, I was unwell for a period of time. Um, yes, I had hoped to wind down my practice, but it was, it was basically to suit their narrative, not, not my primary intention. Um, and then this happened, which is, which is not an uncommon, like you say, the, the flip-flopping and the lack mm -hmm. of direction from, from the organization. Do you, I, I remember when the first notice came out about the clinic closing, like the public, public outcry yeah. was long and loud. Um, patients resented uh, not being able to have access to you. Patients resented being told, well, no, you're going to go to this new clinic and you're going to have new doctors. When I know myself, like, why? There was no reason for that. Um, and the point about uh, stepping into retirement because it suited Island Health Retirement has to be a personal decision. Indeed. You know, to just stop 
when you're not done is mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. So now it's 2022 and Port McNeil has two clinics. We have the new Island Health Clinic in the old building. Yes. And we have the old clinic in the new building between the public library and Harborside Pharma Choice mm -hmm. um, so that people know where it is. So as your patient, how is this going to affect my medical records? Like how are my medical records still at the old building? Are they going to be going to you? What, how does that all work for patients? Yeah, that's so a lot of people have come up to me with that exact same confusion and, and I can only understand how that how that must feel. So I, I put down a few points to say, you know, the their lack of messaging around the chart transfers and care transfer, which are two separate things, was, was really to hide an intent for to limit my practicing in Port McNeil and really asking me to abandon patients when there are no permanent doctors available at the new clinic. There was, uh, there's also no local leadership or mentoring at the new doctors at the clinic. And I was told that there will be two doctors starting in August for two years, in addition to Dr. Tuer, who will be here for at least three years. The rest of the doctors will be locums providing temporary care at the health authority as they try to uh, fine tune things that were, that were done over the years, at least the last 10. Many of you, which we talked about, have come to, to see me about this confusion, and I, and I unfortunately cannot apologize uh, for the lack of disclosure on, on the part of the health authority. I will remain in practice in Port McNeil for as long as I'm able to, and as long as you want me to. It remains an honor for me to be your family doctor. You should feel free to access care at the new clinic and hospital as you need to. I will remain your family doctor and keep your records safe and oversee your care unless you tell me otherwise. You can cancel your chart transfer request uh, from me if you've had, one, had to sign one, and you may also transfer your care and records from the new clinic to me just as you are able to transfer from me to the new clinic. I do want to thank you for your continued loyalty and trust in remaining your family doctor. Given that you can access care in either clinic in McNeil, it is sensible for you to ensure that all recent and ongoing specialist consultations that are generated from either clinic make its way to the other clinic. And that's just so everybody understands where things are and everybody's on the same page. You can simply state the clinic name for that purpose. Test results, prescriptions that are already available at both clinics, and if you wish to transfer your care to the new clinic, you should request a whole chart transfer. So I, I want to be clear that there's, that there's a transfer of records and information, and then there's a transfer of care as a primary care provider. As far as the records go, people, people were, 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 weren't provided enough information, but were asked to sign a piece of paper to transfer records and, and therefore by inference transfer care that wasn't really you know, explained to them or fully disclosed to them. And I think you know, that needs to be clearer. If you want to transfer all your care to the new clinic, you should, un you should request a whole chart transfer and that clinic will be your primary care provider. But I think you know people weren't aware that I that I'm not in practice anymore. Or I will be still in practice now. So if you choose to cancel that request, I, I will remain your family doctor, and I, your records will stay safe with with me. And and I can only send it to where you'd want me to send it to, if you choose to. Sharing some of the information I think is key because it helps you know whomever you see, whether that's the locum, whether that's a new doctor, but there'll be one repository, one final repository of where your records live, and I'm happy to look after that for you ongoing. So we are now back in a position where I can choose who my primary care provider will be and where I want my medical records to be. Right. And so, so you're, that's exactly right. You're, you know, it's important for there to be a, a repository. There should be some trust and, and, and disclosure. People should make informed decisions, but I don't think patients were allowed to make informed decisions. They didn't know what to make of this whole thing that was presented to them or wasn't presented to them, but they were expected to sign over a, a chat transfer, which was really a transfer of care without anybody explaining that to them. Yeah. And I, I do, th I think a lot of people were confused. Yeah. Uh, and feeling that they were losing their choice, um, that that became a big issue. Like, why do I no longer have a choice? Mm -hmm. So we're grateful that we have a choice back.
So what about if I need, if you are my, as the, in the private clinic, will you still be able to refer me for physio? Will I still receive emergency care? Will I be able to be admitted to the hospital? The, the short answer is yes. Uh, so Island Health has basically said, we don't want you in the new clinic, but go ahead and open a new private practice if you'd like to, and that we would not create any barriers. No barriers for me. I understand as that they will continue to honor the support that they've provided for that six months until the end of December, as they have. Uh, that, that, that other care, other allied health care for people who work within the health authority like physiotherapy, social worker, those kind of things, that people are still able to access that if I initiate a referral. And it's not just, even because I'm a private clinic, you should be able to access that for me to allow, to give you, the, to allow you that care. The third thing is that there will be no barriers around working in the hospital and the emergency room because I believe it's a care continuity. People don't have needs only in a clinic setting. They mm. have needs in a continuity of their life and, and lifestyle. And the fourth thing I think is that there'll be no barriers to recruit uh, locums and or other doctors to, to help me look after you uh, and, and other people. So in a way, you know, we've landed at a place where there'll be two clinics in town. Um, they're not necessarily competing against each other, but people get to choose as to the familiarity, the comfort, the trust in terms of how they choose to access care. Um, and I'm happy to be the private, uh, the family doctor as in a private setting and people's designated family doctor as they, as they choose to. You talked about more doctors. Yes. Being as popular as you are. <laughs> um, it can sometimes um, be difficult to get an appointment as soon as you might like. So will you be looking to hire more doctors to be in the private clinic? I, I hope so. So this private clinic down at uh, N. Broughton Boulevard between um, the library and, and, and the pharmacy, like you say, is out of the physiotherapy building. It's a temporary setup. I hope to move to a different place that, occupy, that, that offers more uh, space and more staff that I can continue to provide the care that we were able to provide before. So the short answer is yes, I, I would like to uh, recruit at least one, but probably two more doctors. And I think that will take care of, of all the Port McNeil needs and anybody else from anywhere who needs to access care in the private care setting as they have in the past, which uh, in instead of the publicly funded one that, that Island Health hopes to, to, to make successful. So as far as the patients are concerned, other than the lack of location, it's back to normal. It's business as usual. And I was curious, about how many patients do you expect to see in a week? So I, as you as you probably know, I, I go to Zabalis and Was. Uh, I still do so in Tula uh, uh, two to three days a week, as well as Awikanook, uh, Rivers Inlet. And so there's, 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 there's some limitation in that, but a uh, minimum of uh, usually 200 to 250 people a week um, that I'm still able to see in Port McNeil. That's outside of those other communities. That is mind boggling. Uh, I know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work too. That's a lot of people. I know, I know. I, I hope, you know, there's, there's, there's probably cause for concern for some, by some people uh, that, oh, the quality of the care is poorer and, and all of that kind of stuff. You know, I've been doing the same thing for 15 years. I, it's somewhat easier. I hope to continue to be the best doctor I can be for you and for, for other people uh, with, with all of those parameters in place. And I hope to recruit other people to, for, for, to do the same. New clinic opening, temporary location, new location to come. Yes. Where does this leave you? How are you feeling, feeling about things moving forward? And what are your plans for moving forward? Thanks for asking that, Ryan. I, you know, we started off with, you know, there were there was two things. I've I've always come from a place of advocacy for patients, providers. I wanted the best for people around me. This is my new home. I wanted the best possible, and and so I was fighting against and pushing against systems for that. So. For me personally, I will continue to work in that perspective. Um, I had hope, hope to slow down, but it occurred to me that that narrative wasn't my narrative. It was a narrative that, that was, was forced onto me. 
Personally, as far as the ethnicity and privilege stuff, these are organizations who will continue to make decisions in the absence of objectivity, in the absence of data. There is no accountability. They have responsibility, but no accountability. And there's nothing I can do to change these big systems and organizations. So for me, it's not really closure, but it's an acceptance that this is how the world operates. I, I can focus on things that are manageable for me, and, and it leaves me in a better place in, in terms of being able to do for people what I had originally intended to do. And, and it, uh, it's some degree of closure. You know, there was, when I was in school, uh, I went to my guidance counselor. He was a very, very uh, wise man. And I said, you know, I'm not sure what I want to do. He says, oh, you do reasonably well. You get good grades. Um, but he says, you know, there's one career that you should definitely aspire to. I'm like, oh, oh, what is it? He says, you know, there's, there's very little, um, uh, there's lots of opportunity for this career, and there's very little competition. And I said, oh, what is it? What is it? He says, being a good human being. And being a good human being is by far the best career choice that you make. And being a doctor is by far the second career choice that I, that I, that I make. And, and you know, the same wise guidance counselor would, would often echo things that my family would often say. And, and having a moral compass and a spine is important for, for making your way in the world. So for me, it's, it's let me land in a better place. It's, it's truer to the person I feel I am in trying to be a good human being and making sure I maintain my moral compass and having a spine to continue to advocate for people and do what I love doing uh, for as long as I can. I'm really glad that you've been able to find some closure. I think it's important that you, uh, that you spoke out. And as you say, you can't change a system but hopefully people will continue to poke mm -hmm. and eventually changes will have to be made. So before we go, the other thing I know patients want to know, phone numbers. <laughs> yes. It's on Facebook every other day. What's yes. the number for so-and-so? Yes. So Dr. Armagam, the new clinic's phone number is? 250-949-0887. It is a temporary number. We will maintain that number until we formalize new numbers, new contact details. But 949-0887 is the number to call. Uh, you can always feel free to drop by at the, at the location as well to make an appointment. And until we get a further set up for the, within the temporary clinic and the, and the permanent clinic. And the number for the New Island Health Clinic is 250 250- Nine five six six eight three zero. Yes, I believe that's the number and the same thing. You could phone that number or show up at the clinic to book that appointment as well. Do you think that um, we're through it now? I hope so. I, I, I'm hoping that uh, we can all coexist, that the two new clinics can coexist, and that's essentially Island Health and me, I guess, coexisting in the town. I think the, the net effect and the net intent was to make things better. I'm not convinced that Island Health's actions have made things better. Uh, they've certainly confused they've things. they certainly confused things. <laughs> but maybe, maybe eventually things will get better. Uh, but I think we will, we've landed at a coexistence. I hope that there's no further malice on, on their part um, around, you know, a private clinic and, and continuing to make a success of care delivery in this region. So I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, but is there anything else that you feel needs to be said just before we finish here? I think we're all going to live in changing times. And, and COVID aside, the changing times for healthcare in Port McNeil, it's going to evolve because of this clinic issue. But patients should not feel abandoned. Patients should not feel uh, without um, direction, uh, certainly not in Port McNeil. But there is a regional sense of fragmentation. There's a regional sense of uh, no cohesion and the lack of, of one team for the, for the region. You know, I think it's important for us all to think of not only ourselves, but, but, but our neighbors as well, and how we all get predictable, sustainable care. The health authority has had an infinitely difficult job to try and put that together. There are people within the health authority that are exceptionally uh, competent and good at what they do. I, I only wish that at some point, as for hope for the health authority, that, that senior leadership can actually come up and listen to providers and patients in a very meaningful way and collaborate for the true sense of it rather than this token issue of, you know, we did collaboration and, and it's broken anyway and we can't fix it. For us all to move to a better place, there needs to be 
more effort, more investment. And I think people are part of this investment and part of this effort. And if we can all get there, I think all of this will be a better place for us. Well, that sounds like a really good spot to leave this. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for clarifying it. Um, because so much of what's happened over the last couple of years has been rumors and Facebook posts and, and whatnot. People are kind of struggling to find what's going on. So that's what's been going on. And now things are settled and moving forward. Thank you. I hope it is. I'll be calling for appointments sometime soon. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. So that's good. No problem. <laughs>